and we are live. Peace and blessings, everyone. This is your brother, Asar Imhotep, with the Madhul Indela Institute for the Advancement of Science and Culture. Um, I am your host for the evening. I know it has been a minute since I've been on my channel and have presented y'all with some information. Uh, y'all know I've been in the lab, quote unquote, studying and and producing some works so um, i don't have as much time to be on youtube as i used to uh, but today is a special day and um we're here to address uh and, and respond back to a recent presentation by our good brother uh dr mario Beatty out of howard university and uh, this presentation of his took place this past weekend on the 20th of April, Saturday, April the 20th in New York City at uh, Megar Everest College in Brooklyn. And this was the 36th annual ASCAC conference. And so there was a special plenary uh, focus on the meaning of the place named Kemet. And this was set up by our good brother Reggie um, out of New York. Y'all may know him from the uh, Sonnetter TV and, you know, previous debates and things of that nature. Uh, and just, you know, various commentary on the streets uh, or whatnot. So he's a longstanding member of ASCAC. And um, he was involved in the previous conversation, uh, you know, regarding this topic on the meaning of Kemet. And so uh, he decided he wanted to extend it, you know, beyond the YouTube and bring it to ASCAC. And so um, we agreed and we presented information regarding, uh, you know, some aspects of our research on this topic. Now I'm saying we, uh, and that we consisted of, um, originally it's supposed to be myself, Brother Unk of the Amara Squad, and Brother Wujawu from the Seshi Metanetra group, and um, who were to present in opposition to arguments made by Dr. Mario Beatty, Brother Reggie, and Netter Neb. Um, our good brother Wujawu and uh, our good brother Unk were unable to make it um, that weekend. And so our good brother Sanjeti Unk Ra took uh, Wujawu's place um, at the at the ASCAC, uh, the 36th annual ASCAC conference. And so Netter Neb was unable to make it. And so no one took his his spot on the opposing team. So um, there's some live video. I took some video. I'll be posting each individual presentation at some later date uh, so you can see it in full. And but uh, we wanted to respond, you know, to the uh, to the commentary um, of our good brother, um, Dr. Mario Beatty. And so before we get into that, um, I'm going to share my screen on this other end here. And uh, where am I? So y'all let me know if y'all are able to see um, the the presentation. Uh, and on the on the line, on the panel with me, I have um, our good brother Wujawu. Um, if you're there, uh, say something, introduce yourself. All right, peace. Uh, peace to uh, you, uh, Asar. And uh, peace to the listeners. Um, it's your brother Wujawu Meneb Eri Ma'at. 
and hopefully I'm coming in clear. I was hearing a little static, but um, yeah, I'm here and um, yeah, I'm just ready to have this discussion and hopefully to edify, you know, the listening audience and those who will be watching this video in the archive, because this is a very interesting topic for a lot of people. It's a topic that has been uh, underway or discussed for a few decades. And so hopefully this year, 2019, with our discussion tonight, the discussion took place at ASCAC, and then our future contributions um, in the very near future in the form of publications, hopefully we'll be able to bring this uh, discussion to some kind of uh, conclusion. And uh, so I look forward to that. All right, I appreciate it, appreciate it. So if anybody has been following me for a good number of years, you know, um, every every few months, every couple years, someone wants to debate me on this topic of the meaning of Kenneth. And each and every time they fall short of providing convincing evidence for their premises. And so as a result of not being convincing in their arguments, they try to uh, change locations of the argument, change the argument, deal with everything except with what the topic is about. And so this was just another example of that. And so um, we, again, are going to be responding to Dr. Mario Beatty's um, presentation in particular. Uh, and we're going to do it in three parts. And so, you know, to try to keep each conversation within manageable time. So um, this is only part one. We'll only be dealing with the first 10 minutes of his presentation. And so um, this is just plainly titled a response to Dr. Mario Beatty, you know, ASCAC and Kemet part one. And so before I get started, um, this thing is hidden here. Uh, you know, be on the lookout in the future for some 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 publications and research coming from um, uh, research teams we call the Diopian Seals, uh, a, a multi-focused uh, and multidiscipline nary research team um, and so you know some some more expanded works be in the future but this is just just letting you know what's to come but uh, i want to start off simply with you know the pros and cons of the conversations that we had at ASCAP. and so uh so i'll start off with the pros uh, the conference created a space for the revisitation of an important topic that has yet to be resolved in the academic world. And so uh, they're willing to engage in, uh, they, they created, you know, saying it opened up some space for us to have this discussion. And, you know, that is always a good thing because scholarship is about hashing out, you know, um, arguments so that we can be left with nothing but the truth. And so uh, they open that space for that conversation in an academic setting. Um, secondly, it provided an opportunity for researchers to fine tune and look more critically at their arguments. So, you know, in when something is being presented as a debate, it forces the researchers to look more carefully, you know, at their arguments um, before presenting them to the public. Um, it also created an opportunity for the open exchange and challenge of ideas. So it wasn't just uh, in the normal conference sense, um, you know, where the, the idea was to bring forth uh, purposeful oppositional information so that the, the audience can, um, you know, kind of decide for themselves or, or or, or be broadened, you know, on the subject at hand. And so lastly, it provided the audience to gain um, better knowledge on the background for the debate and expose them to new knowledge and hypotheses. So 
um, for those who may not, you know, necessarily personally be within our particular radar, they were able to see what information, you know, saying is coming up the pipeline. And um, and so the the spreading of knowledge is always a good thing. And so with pros, uh, there's always some cons. And so the the cons of the conference uh, uh, or the so-called debate at the conference, uh, first and foremost, it wasn't a debate. So uh, I should have put that in there, that it wasn't a debate. It was just simply regular presentations. Um, but with that said, uh, there was no question and answer from the audience. So while we were able to share that information, um, for audience members who had questions, they were not able to ask them on, um, you know, after the conversations. And so uh, that, that was a lost opportunity for clarity for the audience members. Secondly, there were no rebuttals from the panelists. So people were able to present information without challenge. And when you pose something as a debate and then you don't allow for rebuttals, uh, it, it looks fishy. Uh, thirdly, time was cut short and the main speaker went over time. And so we were to give, we were to all get 25 minutes. And when I came up to present, uh, I was cut eight minutes. And so within the 20 minutes, um, I, my my conversation was 17 minutes and I was asked to, you know, to wrap up and and leave the stage. And so um, it didn't dawn on me that I had more time until I sat in my seat and my timer was still going. And um, so when I went up stage, I had my clock. I set it for 20 minutes. And when I. Um, you know, so, so I would know exactly when five minutes was just in case, you know, I was in the quote unquote spirit and wasn't paying attention to the timekeeper. So, um, so, you know, that was all, that was a loss. And then, you know, Dr. Beatty came last, so he went 28 minutes. So he went over three minutes. So I lost eight. He went over three. Um, <laughs> and then. Uh, the the con the last con of the uh, conference is that besides myself on the main stage and brother um, son Jetty in the the private room, none of the other two speakers actually were on topic. And so, um, if you're going to frame this as a debate and you're going to have a conversation on the meaning of Kemet, um, it needs to stay on the meaning and not some side arguments and side uh, topics that you want to address that has nothing to do with the topic at hand. And so um, those things were 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 off kilter and it 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 wasn't as potent and it wasn't as beneficial as it could as a result of these uh, these cons. So um, just wanted to say that. And um, before I turn it over to our good brother, Wujawu, I wasn't going to, you know, we don't plan on addressing brother Reggie because he was just so far off the topic and he's just making up new arguments on the fly. And it, it would just take, you know, uh, a, a dissertation to show in every aspect and, and how our, our good brother Reggie was wrong. Um, but he said something in, in his presentation and uh, I wanted to address it because it isn't the first time that I've heard it. Um, and, you know, others have repeated this and because they are not students of linguistics, they don't know better. And so they just repeat something from someone who is in general opposition of me, but who himself uh, has not done this work and wouldn't know what he was talking about on this particular subject. 
And so um, <clears throat> this is from our good brother, Dr. Obadeli Campbell. Um, he is a PhD in linguistics. Uh, he has a master's and um, a PhD in linguistics, uh, the latter from the University of Ghana. Um, he is a research fellow in the language, literature, and drama section of the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana. Dr. Cambone is currently editor-in-chief of the Ghana Journal of Linguistics and secretary of the African Studies Association of Africa. Now, <laughs> what he told Brother Reggie and what Reggie repeated in his presentation had to deal with um, a, a rejection of Jean-Claude Emboli's approach to the reconstruction of Negro Egyptian, originally uh, an activity begun by um, Dr. Theophilo Binga. And his objection to Emboli's uh, work, his 2010 work on the origin of African languages, written in French, is that and, and I know this from speaking with him. So I'm, I'm repeating what I know from conversations with him, which he, which Reggie jumbled up and partly repeated in um, his presentation. And that has to deal with this notion or idea that one must reconstruct the language family, then come back in and then reconstruct ancient Egyptian. And then, you know, uh, in order for it to be included in the reconstruction process for uh, Negro Egyptian. Now, when I had this conversation with, you know, Cambone, I asked him this critical question. I'm like, if your assumption is true, can you show me at least three or four other texts where they make that argument and have shown this to be the process within historical comparative linguistics um, and that this is the this is the standard model, and so when we were on the phone after I asked this question, all of a sudden he had to get off the phone, and so he may have had a legitimate reason. It's just you know uh, a little fishy that when you ask this question, um, that all of a sudden you have to end the conversation. Um, and so I wanted to to throw some citations out here, and I have plenty more because I always have more. Um, and so this one text uh, that we have here, and you know, I repeat this in the upcoming book that I'm writing. So um, I, I wanted to deal with that in, in terms of you know, using ancient Egyptian uh, script um, you know, in the reconstruction process. And the reason why, you know, for at least for him is controversial, because there's there's not a hundred percent correlation to writing scripts and phonemes. And so a writing, uh, a writing grapheme may or may not represent, you know, um, you know, two or more sounds in the language. And so, you know, you have to have other external means to guaranteeing and knowing what's, what sounds are available, you know, in the language. And so, as noted here, it says the division between internal reconstruction and remember, you know, Cambone's argument that you're supposed to reconstruct ancient Egyptian first and its phonology before trying to include it in Negro Egyptian, which is false. Uh, the division between internal reconstruction and the so-called comparative method has certainly been overstressed. In particular, there is no good reason to insist that the former must in execution precede in the application of the latter. In other words, um, it, is, it is a false assumption that you have to do reconstruction of, do internal reconstruction before you can do uh, external reconstruction. And so uh, I'm looking for a text real quick. Hold on one second. Uh, mathematical models and linguistics, uh, African language structures. Okay, I'll deal with that later. <laughs> All right, 
I'm back. So um, we're going to go to the next slide. So in this text here, uh, the continuum companion to historical linguistics, it, Brian D. Joseph, in his uh, on his chapter on internal reconstruction, e reconstruction notes the following. He says, for all, the, for all the fact that internal reconstruction has been shown to be a powerful means of shedding light on the prehistory of linguistic states might otherwise not be amenable to any further historical speculation. It has its limitations as a method. So he's introducing here this notion that while internal reconstruction is powerful, it has some very important limitations. And so he's going to give, he gives more examples, but I'm just going to deal with the first example that he, he gives. So he says, for one thing, not all synchronic alternations, meaning the alternations of phonemes, have arisen by the relative clean path that forms like Greek mele show. And so this word is a word for honey in the Greek language. For instance, the alternation seen in the Greek noun for name with a nominative onoma and a genitive onomatos, lens, that's supposed to be lens with the D, itself to the same sort of analysis as that given for Meli. So what, what was shown previously is that when, when you have the genitive form of the uh, nominative Meli, that this T is at the end of the word, and then you have this os suffix. So you have melitos as the genitive of meli. And so he's given another example here with the word for name. So um, you have onoma and the genitive onomatos. And uh, so with the nominative onoma and the genitive onomatos lends itself to the same sort of analysis as that given for meli. So that one might reconstruct the nominative as onomat and segment the genitive as onomatos. That is perfectly reasonable internal reconstruction, but the comparative evidence in this case is disconformatory, which means that doing the comparative method falsifies this, this notion, even though it seems to be logical within internal reconstruction. Cognitive forms in other languages show that, show no sign of a T in this stem at all, neither in the nominative uh, compare Sanskrit, Nama, Latin, Nomen, Hittite, Laman, nor the genitive, Sanskrit, Namas, Latin, Nominus, Hittite, Lamanas. The T presumably entered the Greek paradigm in some other way than being inherited, being an inherited part of the stem, quite possibly being added to the genitive due to influence from adverbial forms in tos, or else analogically based on genitives or T stems. Therefore, there is no evidence for a prehistoric stage of the Greek with a nominative onomat, even though that is the form that internal construction, uh, internal reconstruction would lend us. And so <laughs> this, what, what he's saying here is that, you know, again, the, the, the comparative method, um, you know, will, will often falsify some ideas that you have for internal. And so this is all going to come to head with this third source here. Um, and, and this comes from a text uh, on Proto-Indo-European. It's, it's one that we have to read for uh, computer science. And <laughs> um, Dr. Basalio says, from the comparative point of view, the method does not prioritize internal or external reconstruction, but treats them as two axes by means of which a single coordinate, the reconstruction is postulated. In this sense, the occasionally emotional discussion concerning the demarcation line between internal and external reconstructions is a costly diversion of our resources. The comparative method gives no priority for internal or external comparisons but seeks an arrangement of the material that results in simultaneously true internal and external propositions in a sound um, and complete, therefore valid reconstruction. So from the three sources that we've already cited already, this notion that you have to reconstruct, do internal reconstruction first before you can do um, external reconstruction is false. 
and you will you will not find any texts who have reconstructed uh languages especially because the issue is here is that egyptian is a quote-unquote dead language so you don't know with 100 percent accuracy what the phonemes are but as our fourth source uh comes to demonstrate that is not a problem and so this comes from the text comparative semitic linguistics a manual by patrick r bennett <clears throat> he starts off he says for most of the ancient Semitic languages, our phonetic knowledge is based on extrapolation from the modern or the better known ancient languages. On transcriptions in other languages, Punic and Latin based transcription in Plautus's play, Ponulus, or Poenulus, uh, Ugaritic and Akkadian inscription, for example, or internal evidence from morphophonemic changes, alternations in spelling, or changes over time. The original scripts, other than cuneiform, are generally reliable for representing phonemic consonant contrast, but vowels are often not represented at all. Vowel quality and quantity may be marked with diacritics or primarily long vowels with matrix lectiononis, consonant symbols conventionally used for vowel markings. He gives an example there. Consonant length may be marked with a diacritic like the Arabic uh, shadat or the Hebrew dagesh or the geish. It is never marked in indigenous Semitic scripts by doubling the consonant symbol. Indication of stress placement is rare. So now we get into the meat. Fortunately, for our purposes, this lack of phonetic detail is not an insurmountable problem. Indeed, in some cases, like the retention of archaic consonantal spellings in Hebrew and Syriac, it may help us, even without being able to specify the pronunciation of a given consonant in, say, Ugaritic we can determine that it corresponds to a particular proto-Semitic unit since it occurs in corresponding positions in related words. Such a sound is said to be a reflex of the unit in the proto-language. Reflexes will normally retain features of the earlier unit they reflect. Thus, the Arabic F, which is a reflex of proto-Semitic P, reconstructed items are soon to be long ago, or soon to belong to the proto-language are marked with an asterisk, retains the voicelessness and labial articulation of P. In some cases, we can draw fairly detailed conclusions regarding probable pronunciation. And so, you know, again, this, this is very important to note. And so just because you don't understand all the sounds in a quote unquote dead language does not mean you have to reconstruct internally um, in order to do historical comparative work. And so, when I asked our good brother Cambone to provide sources, you know, the contrary, again, he had to get off the phone. I don't know why he probably was busy, but I'm just saying that I had ready in my hands several texts that does historical comparative reconstructions and they include dead languages for which there was no internal reconstruction. And so Indo-European is reconstructed with dead languages, which they did not do an internal analysis. Semitic, which we're dealing with right here, is one of those. So in this book, it's actually a workbook. It teaches you how to do historical comparative linguistics using the Semitic languages. And so all of these languages, with the uh, the exception of Arabic here, you know, or were dead languages. And they, they, they also include Akkadian, Ugaritic, and all of this. And so this is part of the, the, the worksheet that you do. So with the Gaez, dead language, all you have is the writing script. Hebrew is the same thing. And so, um, and then you have Ugaritic and some others, which I didn't include here, but they're all in the workbook, all included in this reconstruction process. So I would like to see this standard and we need to bear at least maybe four or five texts because i've i've shown four here so we have to have at minimum as as many as i have and i can show you um texts that i have on reconstructing proto-indo-european and all of them include the dead languages for which they only have the um the 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 scripts and so when when you do not deal with language and linguistics our good brother Reggie, anybody can tell you anything and you just repeat it without knowing what you're talking about. And so we're going to see that this is consistent in this camp when it comes to 
this uh, argument on the meaning of Kemet. They just want to argue for argument's sake and, and, and not deal with the information and give false reasons for rejecting particular ideas that are not standard, you know, in the field um, and for which we're dealing with. So I'm going to end it right there. And I'm going to let Brother Rujaru start off um, the conversation, you know, dealing with uh, Dr. Mario Beatty's um, presentation from the 2019 36th Annual ASCAC uh, Conference. So, you know, whenever you are ready. Okay. Um, hopefully I could be heard uh, clearly. Um just a just a, a bit a, a technical thing. Is it possible that you could uh, remove the avatars at the bottom? I, I just know on the screen still. Yeah, on the public side. Okay, I thought mm. it, um, I already see. I, I I don't know what's happening. I hit yes. I re, I got it removed, and I'm doing it again now, and it's it's going right back to no. Okay, so it's no worries. Just wanted to see if that was. Um, that was possible. Okay, so um, so what I, I just wanted to, I wanted to reiterate a couple of things uh, for clarification purposes for the audience. And uh, one is I don't know if we mentioned this yet, but what I have on my screen, uh, first of all, on the left hand side is a publication that is a um, collection of the essays that was prepared for the ASCAC uh, conference. And so that is now available. Uh, the brother Osara Motep announced it would be available uh, Saturday, but it's available you know, to, as of today, uh, earlier today. So it's available on amazon.com. Uh, you can search under its title. And I believe that Asar will put the link inside the description after we're done for those who may be watching this in the archives. So this text is available there. I'm sorry. The link to the book is already in the description. OK, so there you go. So for those who um, were uh, waiting, anticipating it to be released tomorrow, it's it's available today. So make sure you get a copy. And uh, it's important that you do because, you know, even in our videos here in our discussions, as Asar said, we're going to break this up into three parts. Uh, Dr. Mario Beatty's presentation was approximately 30 minutes long. And so what we decided to do was to take 10 minute segments and have a, a discussion, a critique about about his presentation to keep these videos as a nice, uh, manageable size. All right. And because of that, in totality, uh, it still forbids us to really explore and exhaust these different issues. So it's best that you get the text where you can actually read it for yourself, do your due di di diligence and research the information. And even with that said, this particular text is still just a prelude to a larger text that we are working on that should be released um, uh, in a very near future on the entire topic where we're leaving no stone unturned. And hopefully we can bring some kind of conclusion and closure to this longstanding uh, debate that's been expanded over a few decades. All right. So that's something to look forward to. And I'm just giving you all the heads up on that. All right. So with that being said, um, let me just share my screen and we're just going to get into uh, Dr. Mario Beatty's uh, presentation. All right. Um, so over this weekend, it was a debate. Um, well, actually, we're contributing to the ongoing debate on the meaning of the place name Kemet. And so I want to clarify something that Asar already said, I just want to kind of under, underscore it, is that the ASCAT conference was not a debate, all right? So everyone should have that, have that understanding. And, but the conversation at ASCAT came about through a result of a kind of uh, debate uh, on this topic. You know, uh, every now and then, as Asar said, somebody tries to come and argue these points. And it starts off on social media, on forums, Facebook, and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, the, our good brother Reggie brought this conversation to the floor of ASCAC, but it's not in a style or framed as a formal debate. And, and I'm pointing this out because there's consequences to 
it not being a formal debate, but yet the, the style or the framing in which the conversation took place. All right. So I just want to make that clear. Um, all right. So now I just want to go through a few general reminders for everyone for clarification purposes. So what this conversation is not about. OK, so this is what is not in dispute. All right. So number one, what's not in dispute is does the word black exist as an adjective in the ancient Egyptian language? No one is disputing that. That is um, widely known, widely accepted, and the consensus among scholars and the likes. All right. So no one is disputing if there is a word black in the ancient Egyptian language as an adjective that happens to be the word Kim. All right. So no one's disputing that. So hopefully we're clear on that. Two, can we find cognates of this particular adjective black in related African languages? So that's not a, a question um, that we're asking because that's not in dispute. OK, we know that there are several cognates in uh, uh, among various different African languages that would be cognate to the ancient Egyptian word Kim, meaning black. All right. So this is known. That's not in dispute. Three, did the Egyptians use color terms to describe a person or a thing or people or things, et cetera, et cetera? That's not in dispute. We know that the Egyptians described things and used various different colors, black being one of them. All right. So that's widely known. That's not in dispute. Four, do classifiers or what's popularly called determinatives, do they have to be present for every attestation of a word? In other words, do determinatives have to be there for every single word in the ancient Egyptian language? Uh, that's not a question that we're asking. Why? Because it's not in dispute. We know that classifiers are sometimes omitted and not included on some words in the ancient Egyptian language. That's not in dispute. All right. So if you hear these things come up in anybody's arguments, let it be known that that is not in dispute and that is off topic or what we call a red herring. All right. So with that being said, um, what Dr. Mario Beatty um, did, as a matter of fact, I, I think I should um, start to play his uh, portion of the video. And that way, we're, we're very clear because we don't want to uh, run the risk of mischaracterizing anyone's arguments. And just as a, as a um, FYI, anyone who's formally trained in argument theory and debating, where the, um, the foremost you know, manifestation of debating uh, would be in the court system, you know, lawyers, uh, they, they actually exhibit uh, you know, the form of debating all day, every day. Um, anyone's trained in debating knows that one of the first things that you do is in an argument is that when you respond to an argument or claim that someone's making, it's your job to repeat their claim or their argument for the purposes of making sure that you are on the same page or you have a meeting of the minds with the person that's making the claim. So you're allowing the person who's made the claim and the audience know that you understand their claim in the first place. And what that does, it, it uh, allows you to avoid mischaracterizing their claim and then talking for an extended amount of time on your mis mischaracter mischaracterization and not even addressing the claim um, as it is. OK, so one of the first steps is to always reiterate a person's claim even if it's in your own words, to show that you understand what they're claiming. All right. And so in that spirit, I want to play Dr. Beatty's words himself so that we don't uh, mischaracterize anything that he says. And like I said, this is a total of 30 minutes long, but we're only going to deal with 10 minutes tonight. So I'm going to play some and we're going to pause and we're going to give some commentary. All right, so I'm just gonna start off, and then uh, so just sit back and, and listen. I hope you all got your pens and, and uh, paper or notepads open. All right. All right, little tip, everyone. Okay, in the first slide, come on. After this one. 
Um, wait to the break. Um, I don't know my presentation is. It was in the library. You know, we spent a lot of hours on what, what door is. To the right. is. But the title of my presentation is Why Canada? Uh, insight into reconceptualizing, reconceptualizing national identity. Okay, I want to pause it right there because he introduces his presentation. Uh, and what his focus is in his presentation. And so what has to be noted here is, and I'm just gonna switch over so we all can see um, what his presentation is. So this is the title of his presentation, Why Kemet? Insights into Reconceptual Reconceptualization of National Identity, all right? Now, what needs to be pointed out is the fact that this is a, a, a result, and, and this is what we spoke about a, a few seconds ago. Because ASCAT conference is not styled as a formal debate with, with the debating methods and procedures and rules that govern a debate, such a debate, what happens is you have a pseudo debate. And pseudo is like a fake style of debate where it appears to be a debate, but it's not really governed by the rules of debate. And like I said earlier, there's consequences to that. And so what's happened is that the presentations given at ASCAC related to a contribution of the meaning of the place name Kemet was framed in such a way as to result in a pseudo debate. This type of discourse is vulnerable to many problems that actual debates are designed to avoid, mainly in a, an abundance of logical fallacies. So in this particular discussion, the Semshu Heru research team, which is myself, Brother Sanjeri, um, and Brother Osari Motep, uh, our focus is on the meaning of the place name Kemet, which would be the what. OK, now, Dr. Beatty, by his own admission, his focus is on the reasons why the word Kemet was used. So he focused on the why. Now, those two parallel topics are related, but they're not the same. And so we have to be clear here, because if you confuse one for the other, then you're not going to benefit from the conversation because it's gonna give the appearance of one argument being um, supported or refuted when it may or may not actually be the case. Okay, so I wanna make that clear for everyone to understand. And again, this is a consequence of pseudo debates. And pseudo debates are, are, are discussions that appear to be debating, but it's not conforming to the rules of debates, the rules and methods of debates, all right? So I want to make that uh, point that out. And so let's continue on. Uh, if I can switch back over here. All right. So we're going to continue on. Hope everyone's following. By the way, this particular footage uh, is from the sister uh, Monica's uh, phone. She was there. And um, shout out to the sister and the brother, um, Sean, who were, who were uh, present at the uh, conference. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm going to dedicate this presentation to uh, Shaykhan to Joe and next slide. And in the 1974 UNESCO symposium, uh, Shaykhan to Joe actually gives credit to deciphering what the word can it mean. He actually gives credit to another African. Um, this other African, he says, is Susu in Sudan, uh, who was to compile this part of the present chapter. Uh, so, um, I give credit to this brother too, uh, for this particular thing. Next slide. Okay. So, um, just something to comment about that. And, um, also brother, sorry, if you, if you have anything to add while I, you know, as I'm doing this, um, by all means, uh, jump on in. But now to comment about that particular, uh, point. So BD says that Diop gives credit to the decipherment or the deciphering of what the word Kemet means to another African, uh, Susu Nsogan. And um, the, the thing about that is that there's no information given about this particular person, okay? Um, there's no information on the method that was used to how he came up with the meaning of the word Kemet, what he used, what sources, um, you know, procedure, method, nothing, absolutely nothing was given only that a name is mentioned and that's it so the question it begs the question of what were his methods 
How did he come up with the meaning of the word Kemet? There's nothing shown uh, at all. OK, so, I, you know, that's something that we have to understand. Um, so although credit is given to someone, it has no value in this discussion because it's nothing to bite on. All right. Uh, sorry, you had something to say. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, you hit it right on the right on the head. It's it's when you introduce someone if, if you're having an academic discussion and you know it he you you always cite your sources especially for ideas that you did not originate so he partially cites a source but he doesn't say in what context like he doesn't even have the discussion in terms of how our good brother uh Susao, came to his conclusion what was he looking at what text what what other comparative work did he look at where he said that this was the tradition in terms of methodology in the ancient egyptian uh writing script you get no such in we don't know if he's a friend colleague if it's his grandfather you know um Nothing. It's just a name, a random name. And that would not be acceptable in any, you know, academic setting in terms of a citation. I couldn't turn in my dissertation and say, you know, Brother Wujawu, you know, is the one who came up with this. And then like, who's Brother Wujawu? How does he relate to this topic? Does he have anything written on the subject? You know, what's the context? And so Diop just gets an idea from a random brother. We don't even know if he studies Metanature, does linguistics. We don't know nothing about him. And so this is a, a blip on, on Diop's part, you know, for not explaining that. So we don't know if Diop accepted entirely his argument or if he rejected aspects of his argument and accepted some, you know, we would like, we would need to know what was his entire argument. And so it's just, it's just, it's messed up from the start. And, you know, and, and this is something that, you know, no one else has been able to try to defend is it's unduplicatable. And so it's unrepeatable in the ancient Egyptian uh, writing script in terms of the method espoused by Diop in terms of reading that one example of the seated man and woman with plural strokes uh, behind the word Kemet in the Calhoun Papyrus, for which he was citing in his 1977 work. And so, um, so in, in terms of methodology, that's a no-no. But um, I'll end there. OK, um, what I want to add to that uh, quickly is um, I want to give what this where this is coming from and why this brother's name was mentioned. So um, let me uh, share my screen here. So this particular text is from the UNESCO General History of Africa, Volume 2. And this particular page uh, 41 under the article uh, or the section of an article called the Egyptians as they saw themselves, as you can see on the screen. And so if you look at footnote 44, this is what Dr. Uh, Mario Beatty is making reference to, which is um, what Sheikh Antajiop is saying. So he's saying at footnote 44, this important discovery was made on the African side by Sosu and Sogan, who was to compile this part of the present chapter. So the question is, did this particular brother actually prepare this chapter? Because the way it's worded is as if he was supposed to, but he didn't. As it says, it says, who was to compile this part of the present chapter? So it's unclear. And so, so the mentioning of this brother's name is, is just raises more questions uh, than it does any answers. And by the, by the way, footnote 44 is coming from up here where you see my cursor, where it says the Egyptians 
only had one term to designate themselves. And this is uh, in this form here, Kemet, equaling the Negroes literally. And so that's where the footnote is. is. So this is being uh, attributed to this particular African brother, Sasu and Sogan. Okay, so I just want to make sure that's clarif clarified for um, the audience listeners. All right, so let's go back to um, Dr. Beatty and we'll continue forward. And by the way, I just want to say this. Um, I, I think if if this is still okay with the brother Osara Motep, um, we will, you know, entertain a couple of, you know, some questions um, after we uh, discuss, we get through this first 10 minutes. So I'm going to kind of speed things up uh, now. So I'm going to let it play and we're going to address a few few more things. Um, at the UNESCO conference, just a, a brief review. Um, at the UNESCO conference, what would be the proceedings of the unabridged volume of the General History of Africa, Volume 2? There is a debate, many debates, but there is a debate around the word Kemet. But the main protagonist was a brother from the Sudan, uh, Abdel Ghadir Abdallah. And Abdallah, I kind of feel like we're recreating the 1974 UNESCO conference. Um, because Abdallah um, said at that conference that uh, the word Kim didn't mean black. And that was what started the whole tete a tete at the UNESCO symposium on the issue of Kim. And so immediately after he said that, a French Egyptologist, Sir Saint Laurent, intervened. And Sir Saint Laurent intervened and said, no, 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 no. Kim does mean black. And so Sir Saint Laurent and Jean Leclerc issues of race and culture. But not an issue of whether or not the word Kim meant black. Next slide. Okay, so this is a moment to pause. Now, take note of everything he said because I don't, I don't want to have to rewind it. But now, the important takeaway from this point uh, here, and let me go back to the slide here, and hopefully everyone can see this. Okay, the important takeaway here is that this is exactly why, or this is the, this is the exact reason why a debate should really be a debate and not a pseudo styled debate because in a formal debate logical fallacies are avoided and um you know being a, a on a debating team in college myself uh you know i remember that when you perform logical fallacies points are taken away uh from your presentations and things on your team and so on and so forth so it's very very uh rigid in that sense um and so what has occurred here, what Dr. Beatty has done is that he has mischaracterized our argument or the opposing side's argument. And so what he's done, he's he's lumped the argument of the oppose, opposing side to his argument under an argument by um, this person that he mentioned, um, Abdel Ghadir M. Abdullah from Sudan. All right. He's the, as Mario Beatty said, uh, he's the protagonist uh, in the debate at the UNESCO conference, and he claimed that the word Kim does not mean black. And so if you recall, what in my general reminders, I said, what is not in dispute? Does black exist as an adjective in ancient Egyptian language? That is not a question that we are asking or in dispute of. We do not claim what Abdella claimed that Kim does not mean black. So Dr. Mario Beatty bringing him up and implying that we are on that particular side of protagonist uh, um, claim was false. That's a logical fallacy. And so what a formal debate would do, it would tease those things out. And Dr. Uh, Beatty would not be allowed to, to pursue that, that line of, of discourse or it would be pointed out. All right, so I'm pointing it out right now that we do not agree with Abdullah um, out of Sudan that Kim does not mean black. 
the word chem, there is a word that's, that's chem that does mean black. All right. So we all have this understanding. So it must be noted that we do not dispute the existence of the adjective chem meaning black. BD is an error by aligning our argument with Abdullah. All right. So I just want to point that out so we can get back to um, to what he's saying. And let me switch my. All right. So that entire framing what is done in error. All right. So I want to point that out because to the average listener, it may not seem so. But let's let's continue. Uh, sorry. Did you have any comment on that one? No, that's that's pretty much it. It's the uh, again we because Dr. Mario Beatty is so off topic, he has to reach for arguments, arguments that no one is making, and so this is is nothing like the 1974 symposium. Um, you know, so I don't know why he felt that way, because you know he obviously wasn't privy to any of our arguments. Which is why he never he never even attempted to address any of our arguments, neither him or Reggie. Right. And, and this is what was disappointing to me to have someone of his stature and his caliber to involve himself in the discussion and then not engage the topic at all. And then in his attempt to engage the topic, so be far off topic and then just make up arguments that no one is even having. And so that was the the you know one of the major disappointments that I that I had with the with with the with the event and with our um our, our good brother Dr. Beatty. Right. And and so the question may be asked if if this wasn't a debate, which it wasn't, then why go, why attend, why present? And, you know, that's a rather silly uh, question uh, to ask, because uh, as Asar put put forward in his intro, the pros, if you go back and rewind his video, he gave the pros of having such a discussion in such a conference at such a place, et cetera, et cetera. So I would uh, defer or refer you to look back over on that. All right. So uh, let's continue. By way of conclusion, so if I don't complete my time, I'm going to give you my conclusion up front. Okay. <laughs> By way of conclusion, the word Kemet refers to a novel ethno-geopolitical national marker of identity that was primarily forged in the cauldron of the internal contradictions and in politics of what is referred as the first intermediate period. Novel in two fundamental ways. One, the innovation of a unitary concept of the nation, and two, the political need to more rigidly distinguish themselves as a nation of people, which is clearly shown in a new hyper discourse around borders. Tosh, internally and externally, initially and principally directed against the people from Western Asia in the first intermediate period. Next slide. Okay, so this is worth uh, pausing here. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to show what his conclusion, um, just a trans transcription of that same conclusion that we just heard him say, uh, just so everyone be can be clear. So this is uh, Dr. Mario Beatty's conclusion, and I'll just reread it. He said, the word Kemet refers to a novel ethno-geopolitical national marker of identity that was primarily forged in the cauldron of the internal contradictions and politics of what is referred to as the first intermediate period. Novel in two fundamental ways. One, the innovation of a unitary concept of the nation. Two, the political need to more rigidly distinguish themselves as a nation of people, which is clearly shown in a new hyper discourse around borders, Tosh, internally and externally, initially and principally directed against people of Western Asia in the first intermediate period. OK, so now what this confirms now, you know, uh, BD. Uh, expressed his conclusion early in his presentation, which a lot of people do um, in time presentations, because sometimes your time may be cut short and you never get to your conclusion. So, you know, it, it is um, some sort of standard practice where people will start with their conclusion um, and then and then go into, you know, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, but 
what this does, it it confirms that BD's topic is off topic. As I said, in the, as I said in the beginning, you know, uh, here, you know, our discussion is on the what, whereas Dr. Beatty's discussion is on the why. And his conclusion confirms that. Why was Kemet used? And so if you read his conclusion and, and ask yourself that question, start off with that question. Why was Kemet used? And then read Beatty's conclusion and you'll see that he's to focused on why, not the what, which is the meaning of the actual word. And as Asar put forward in his presentation at ASCAC, which we'll probably go uh, in part two or part three, is that this is a linguistic discussion. It is falls under the, the, the subheading of semantics because we're talking about meaning, okay? Semantics and etymology. And so what Dr. Beatty is doing, he's bypassing all of that or he's, he's, he's walking down a different pathway in his discussion. And so this needs to be pointed out, all right, that we're talking about two parallel discussions that are related, but they're distinct. OK, uh, sorry, you have anything on that? No, that's that's pretty straightforward. Um, it, it's, you know, again, once we've established that he's off topic, anything that he says in his uh, lecture is ultimately going to be irrelevant to the subject you know this is because i knew this was going to happen you know every everyone who are not linguists who try to answer this question on the meaning of kemet try to try to avoid linguistics in the historical comparative method and as a result of that you know that's why i focus on methodology and and and, and showing the citations for those who who have no clue of what is going on. So if we're asking the etymology and the meaning of the word Kemet, there's a process, there's a methodology, a standard methodology that is adhered to by all etymologists. And so given that this is a linguistic question, you can only use linguistics to answer it. And so he's trying to bypass linguistics and by some um, manner of osmosis somehow come up with the right conclusion and that's that's poor methodology and that will always end up in folk etymology and so we can get into that later all right um just a bit of a technical issue um because asar has the avatars uh still showing what i did i shrunk the 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 um slide so that people can see the full slide so um i apologize if you all couldn't I see why it keeps doing that i keep clicking it's like right now it's on yes so mm. broadcast a large video that i see all right so so yeah i shrunk it so people could see the whole slide so um the previous slides prior to that i apologize um if you all couldn't see the full slide so now hopefully you can and um so what I wanted to add to what you said is that um, in order for us to address Dr. Beatty's um, presentation, what he actually presented about, we would he, he would be leading us off topic. And so I, what I what I want to point out to the audience is that because we're not addressing uh, some of the things that he said, which would be would be off topic, don't uh have any doubt in your mind that we're unable to address what he actually said for for instance about the question why we can address that but that but we have to have an understanding that that's a completely different pathway of of a conversation that we're that we're more than able <laughs> to have we you know we, we could we could talk about that but what we would like to do in the spirit of being true scientists and people who actually understand how debates and argumentations work we want to stay on topic all right so i just want to point that out to the to the audience so so there's some things that we're not going to address for the sake of not you know not risking going off topic as he did okay and and i want to say this too um when i say he went off topic or when we say he went off topic again this wasn't a debate so technically you know, it's a presentation. So so he, he could present on whatever he wish, you know, because I'm not trying to say that, you know, he's he's limited to one thing or the other, 
because this wasn't a formal debate. And, you know, anybody who presents are able to present on whatever topic that was approved to to discuss. But the problem is when you do that and you imply that it's a debate. And so the, hence why I say pseudo debate. And I, and I gave the consequences and problems of doing that. OK, so I just want to make that clear to everybody. All right. Um, now, and we are going to address this. We are going to address the whys, but we, but you know, again, you know, we, we're going to be actually ed educating people on why the word Kemet was used, but we first have to establish <laughs> what it means. And then we're going to understand why it was used. Okay. All right. So let, let's continue because I don't want to be uh, too, too long. Let me go back to the video and let's keep it going. So, how do we know? So, you know, Asar, you know, gave some examples of my work, and I'm going to give some examples of your work. <laughs> uh, how do we know that Asar Imhotep means Osiris who comes in peace? How is it that we know that? We know that through a process of historical evolution within the Kemetic language, where Asar is Usine in Coptic. E, which is to come, continues all the way to Coptic. Otep is a word that continues from the beginning all the way to Coptic. Asar's method, unfortunately, is not a historical comparative method. It's an ahistorical comparative method. It's ahistorical in the sense that what Asar does is that he wants to bypass the historical evolution of the Egyptian language that ends in Coptic. And so because he does not feel that Coptic is a part of the Egyptian language, he feels that it's a separate language. So what Asar does in his comparative method is that he goes into other areas and he doesn't go through Coptic. He goes around it. And that's where Obina's method is the correct method. This is good. Okay, so I would pause it there and um, Asar. I, if you want me to keep it going and tell me to pause it or you want or you have some commentary from from that point no you you're good um yeah because we'll it'll come up in the conversation so so go ahead oh let it play some more um no i was just saying if you if you oh okay well i, I can say this for one um the because he's not familiar with historical comparative linguistics he makes a claim that uh, is just just bad methodology in general. But here is an example, first and foremost, where he mischaracterizes my argument or method. He doesn't know my method because he hasn't read anything um, that I've done dealing with this um, issue of Kemet. Because if he'd known, he would have known that we went through Coptic. So where he's, again, where he's making this stuff up, I don't know, you know, he may be a busy person dealing with ASCAC, you know, teaching classes. He may not have had time to really review, you know, um, any kind of videos that we've done, um, you know, any any works that I have on this subject. Uh, he is it's just, he's totally oblivious to the facts. And, and so he repeats this misinformation not knowing that again, because he's off topic, he uh, he he's just off topic because this this has to do if if we're going through Coptic, quote unquote, we would go through Coptic in a historical comparative method, trying to do some kind of reconstruction necessarily. But this is not the case here. We're not trying to decipher the hieroglyphs and that's what it seems like he seems to be um trying to to posit that we are somehow engaged in in the process of deciphering the hieroglyphs that we need to go through coptic 
The hieroglyphs have already been deciphered. So we go to Middle Egyptian. Why do we go to Middle Egyptian? Because Middle Egyptian has the fuller forms. Plus it has the determinatives, the classifiers to bring clarity to the term. Coptic does not have that. And so when doing comparative work, there's not even, um, Coptic doesn't even retain most of the KM uh, words that are present in Middle Egyptian and New Kingdom. And so it's just it's just asinine to 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 even make that argument. You know, it's again, when you're reaching for straws, uh, you know, anything seems logical to you. And that's not the case. We're not we're not talking about pronunciation. We're talking about meaning. And so. Um, so, yeah, it's it's. Uh, that's all I can say at, at, at this point until we play some more. Okay, so what I would like to add to that is um, for those who are listening, um, the the decipherment, people have to understand what decipherment is and what it entailed in terms of the ancient Egyptian language and its writing system. So in gist, we, we actually wrote a whole book on the decipherment process as a rebuttal to uh, Professor Walter Williams. And we went into details on the decipherment process, what it's all about, why such a process is, is uh, taken in the first place. So definitely seek out that book for details. But in gist, when you decipher, what you're deciphering is, a, is, the, is the mapping of what is spoken to what is written. In other words, the spoken language to the written form. Because remember, a writing system is the visual representation